10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hello, my friends, and thank you so much for coming and choosing to spend part of your Monday, January 8th with me. It is 4 p.m. here in New York, and we are going to continue our discussion into the case of Karen Reed. So many of my viewers are new to this case, so we've sort of taken it from the beginning. We did a bit of a deep dive yesterday into the probable cause affidavit and also into the witness statements that we had available to us. And I think everybody's kind of getting a grip on it. And there are so many new viewers who are also joining who are very, very familiar with the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed case. And so many of them have been so kind and so helpful and emailing me and sending documents. And I love it, you guys. Keep it up. You're doing some great detective work. And because my channel, first I want to thank Gary Reed for gifting five Attorney Melanie Little memberships. Thank you so much, Gary. That is very, very kind of you. If you want to opt into gifted memberships, there's a way to do that on your phone. I just don't know exactly how it is, but my moderators do know and they will tell you. I think it has something to do with clicking on the settings or the three dots, but it depends if you have an Android and an iPhone. I don't really know. It's not my thing. I'm not a technology person. But what I am is a legal analyst and commentator and a licensed New York attorney of 30 years. And so I'm here to break it down for you from the legal perspective. And I like to stick to the legal documents and the court documents and the court file. And I don't want us to get sidetracked into any of the side drama that's going on with this case. So I'm going to ask if you're here, if you've been here before, you know that we like to keep it classy in the chat. I'm not a fan of the cursy words or, you know, any foul language or any personal attacks on me, my moderators, each other, people that we might talk about, people that are related to this case, and they will be deleted. You might be timed out and blocked and you really don't want that. So keep it classy. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that... Um, I know all about Turtle Boy. I know all about Turtle Boy. And I know you guys are big fans of his, supporters of his. But what I don't want to do is get sidetracked into that part of this case. So if we could refrain from talking about that in the chat or in the comments, that would be great. Because what I want to do today is I want to stick to the facts. I want to stick to what's in the court file. And I want to discuss it with you and explain it to you and tell you why I think certain things are important why I think certain things are not important. And I'm going to give you my opinion about the way that I think things are going to go. I've been getting a lot of comments about things like, you know, you're on the wrong side of this. You don't want to risk your career on this. And I'm like, well, I'm a legal analyst and commentator. That's what I do. I do this on a lot of cases, a lot of cases that are just as divided as this case is. So that is what I do. That is what we do here on this channel and welcome. Thank you for coming. So what I thought we were going to do today, what I thought we would do today is since there's been so much talk about the weather and what the weather conditions were during the course of these events that occurred in the early morning hours of January 29th of 2022 in Canton, Massachusetts, um, I want to go back and I want to review with you. There was a motion filed in September by the defense looking to subpoena the records from the Canton Department of Public Works, who is in charge of plowing the streets in the town where 30 feet, <laughs> Bob Weir likes my hat. Look at that. Bob Weir is here again, Bob Weir. I mean, catfished by so many Bob Weirs that I don't know if this is really the real Bob Weir, but I hope it is. Um, yes, I agree with you. I wasn't born with Thorn. The side parts, parts add to the possible corruption, but right now I want to make this about the case against Karen Reed. So if we could just save that, I want to just table all that dialogue for maybe another day because my viewers are not as caught up on this case as some of you people who um, live in the area and have been living with this case since the arrest and since the events of January, 2022. So that's all I'm saying for now. And, uh, 
that's where we're going to go. This is funny. Just Chrissy the Cronos, Massachusetts folks. D- no, don't like the weather. Wait 10 minutes. We used to say that in Boulder, Colorado. If you don't like the weather, wait 10 minutes. Where it is always sunny, 360 days a year. Sco buffs. You know, it was so funny last night when I said that I scheduled the uh, the show at four o'clock because there was hockey last night. And then I looked, I was so excited to go watch the game and I realized the games are today. So duh. Rangers at seven, Bruins at nine. Right? Let's agree to disagree about hockey. That could be one thing that we fight about when it comes to playoffs. Okay, let's do that. All right. So what I want to do is I want to look at the defendant's motion for, well, first let's talk about the motions that were filed on Friday and they were impounded. And a lot of people had questions about what that means. So let me just explain to you what motions were filed on Friday. And um, Boston 25 uh, covered this a little bit and I don't want to play their footage because I don't know how they are about letting people play their footage right now. I know there's a lot of stations that allow me to do it and a lot of stations that don't. So let's just stay, keep it on the safe side. Um, and it says here, now I will just read to you what Boston 25 wrote about this case. Lawyers representing a Massachusetts woman accused of killing a Boston police officer have mounted their latest bid to defend their client. This time by filing a late Friday motion that seeks to get the indictments tossed over alleged prosecutorial prosecutorial misconduct. The defense's motion also sheds new light on a federal investigation involving witnesses in this case. Prosecutors have charged Karen Reed with secondary murder for allegedly killing her Boston police officer boyfriend, John O'Keefe, by backing into him with her SUV and leaving him to die in a snowstorm on January 29th, 2022. Boston 25 obtained the defense's Friday afternoon filing in which Reed's lawyers say the Norfolk County District Attorney has disclosed six letters dated May to November 2023 between the DA's office and the U.S. Attorney's Office, U.S. Department of Justice, or the FBI. The motion says that in a May 18, 2023, four-page letter, Norfolk County DA Michael Morrissey told the Office of Professional Responsibility at the U.S. Department of Justice, that he was aware that multiple state witnesses in the Reed case had received subpoenas to appear before a federal grand jury. According to the defense's motion, that May 18th, 2023 letter from Morrissey says that the first assistant at the U.S. Attorney's Office spoke with the DA's office, quote, disclosing the existence of a federal investigation involving a number of witnesses in the Karen Reed case, end quote. The defense motions motion says Morrissey's letter also says, quote, we have confirmed that witnesses testified before the grand jury, end quote. But the defense motion also says that in a December 4th notice of discovery, the DA's office said it had received no, quote, confirmation about whether any witnesses, end quote, in the Reed case had testified before a federal grand jury. Quote, compounding its failure to make timely disclosure to the defense of this information it knew about and that tended to negate the defendant's guilt, the Commonwealth failed to make any disclosure at all until it was apparent that media outlets had gained the information and would be reporting on it. End quote, reads the defense motion. Quote, the Commonwealth's assertion in its court filed notice for discovery was patently false. Notice of discovery was patently false. The motion later reads, the the defense says Morrissey used that letter to argue that the U.S. Attorney's Office was targeted, his office, for investigation because of the then outgoing U.S. Attorney's, quote, personal animosity toward me, end quote. Reed's defense team also argues that Morrissey's August video calling for an end to harassment of witnesses amounted to tainting the jury pool and unethical, quote, personal vouching for numerous named Commonwealth witnesses, end quote. Reed's team wants the judge to dismiss indictments against Reed over Morrissey's alleged failure to adhere to ethics rules and constitutional due process requirements. It was unclear Friday whether that argument would hold water with three months to go before the March 12th trial. Of course, Morrissey's office had no comment to that. 
And the judge ruled later in the day that that motion was to be impounded, which is language that we do not use here in New York. But what that means is essentially the motion is under seal and it's not available to the public. So that's where that stands right now. That motion is currently under seal and nobody can access it. There is going to be a hearing on January 18th for the two motions on Friday that were improperly served against certain parties that they need to re-argue or actually argue for the first time. And we will see what happens with this motion to dismiss that is currently under seal. Apparently it got leaked and some people got a copy of it, but I couldn't find it. And since it's under seal, I wouldn't feel right ethically showing it to you anyway. So I thought I would just read you that little tidbit from Boston 25. And that's where that stands right now. But in order to get back to the weather and the snowplow, and so many of my viewers don't really know a lot about this case, but we're going to learn about it now and what the snowplow driver has to say. So let's take a look at this. This is um, defendant's motion for order pursuant to Massachusetts Rule of Criminal Procedure 17, directed to the Canton Department of Public Works and the Canton Town Clerk. So this motion was made again back in September. And here are the records that they were requesting at this time. They wanted the judge to allow them to subpoena records from the Canton Town Clerk seeking GPS data associated with all snow plows deployed by the Canton Department of Public Works or DPW between 12.30 a.m. and 6.30 a.m. on January 29th of 2022 to plow the area surrounding 34 Fairview Road in Canton. This should include all GPS data associated with Canton DPW truck number 30, which was assigned to Brian Lochran on January 29th, 2022, between 12.30 and 6.30 a.m. You may also know him as Lucky. If you are familiar with this case, he goes by Lucky as well. Number two, dispatch record and records and route records associated with all snow plows deployed between 12.30 a.m. and 6.30 a.m. on January 29th, 2022, in the town of Canton. Three, Contracts and service agreements with any and all companies that the Canton Department of Public Works contracted with for the purpose of tracking its snow plows in January of 2022, which should include any GPS tracking and or fleet management databases. Number four, any and all records, communications, and or other information relating to records of service and or issues with the fleet management database or GPS systems used to track Canton's DPW snow plows between January 24th 2022 and January 29th, 2022. This should include records of service, communications regarding malfunctions with the GPS system and or fleet management database and or communications regarding repairs or corrections of any malfunctions. And this looks like the same thing. That was to the Canton Department of Public Works. They also wanted to serve the same subpoena on the town clerk. That's what I just read to you. They, they're looking for the same details from the Canton Department of Public Works. And here are the supporting, supporting facts as stated by the defense. One, Ms. Karen Reed. Uh, Ms. Reed stands charged with the following crimes arising out of the death of her late boyfriend, John O'Keefe. Murder in the second degree in violation of Massachusetts General Law Section 265, Count 1. Manslaughter while under the influence of alcohol in violation of MGL Section 265, 13 and a half, Count 2. And leaving the scene of a personal injury and death in violation of MGL Section 90, 24, 2 a and a half, Count 3. Given the court's intimate knowledge of the facts of this case, the foundational facts surrounding this case are discussed herein only briefly. The footnote one says, the facts set forth in defendant's rule 17 motion for order pursuant to Massachusetts rule of criminal procedure 17 directed to Brian Albert, Verizon and AT&T are incorpor incorporated herein by reference. Number two. 
The Commonwealth's theory of the case is that Ms. Reed became suddenly angry with O'Keefe outside the home of Boston police officer Brian Albert just after midnight on January 29, 2022, and reversed into him with her vehicle, shattering her taillight and somehow causing injury to only his head and arm before fleeing the scene. In order for the Commonwealth's theory of the case to make any sense, Mr. O'Keefe would have been incapacitated and bleeding on Brian Albert's front lawn mere feet from the roadway from the moment the Commonwealth claims Ms. Reed hit him with her car until his body was discovered just after 6 a.m. on January 29th of 2022. Three. However, no witness suggests that they observe Ms. Reed strike Mr. O'Keefe with her vehicle, <clears throat> injure him in any way, or otherwise drive erratically on the night in question. Moreover, in spite of the fact that six individuals, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, Brian Higgins, Sarah Levinson, Julie Nagel, and Colin Albert all left the Albert residence in the early morning of January 29th, 2022. Not one of these individuals observed Mr. O'Keefe's body sprawled in Brian Albert's front yard, <clears throat> mere feet from the roadway. All of them would have driven on to leave. Footnote two. Footnote two says as follows. <clears throat> oh, I'm such a frog in my throat today. It's not your um your speakers, it's my voice. Notably, on September 19th of 2022, defendant Karen Reed filed a Rule 17 motion requesting cell phone records relating to all of the individuals who were present at the Albert residence on the night in question. In support of that request, counsel argued. At least six individuals claim to have left the Albert residence in the early morning of January 29th, 2022, after Ms. Reed had left the Fairview Road residence and returned home. Jennifer McCabe and Matthew McCabe purportedly drove Julie Nagel and an unnamed female home at 1.30 a.m. Brian Higgins supposedly went to complete, quote, administrative work at the Canton Police Department around 1.30 a.m. And Colin Albert supposedly returned home to his parents' residence at approximately 12.30 a.m. Yet none of these individuals, not one, claims to have seen Mr. O'Keefe's body sprawled in Brian Albert's front yard, mere feet away from the very roadway all of them would have driven on. This argument was reiterated vigorously in court at the hearing on the Rule 17 motion on October 3rd, 2022. Affidavit of Alan Jackson at page four. Remarkably, Two days after the defense made these facts known, the court and attorney Lally in a public hearing on October 5th, 2022 at 11 a.m., Trooper Michael Proctor met with partygoer Ju Julie Nagel and interviewed her for the very first time. So the incident happens January 29th of 22. Julie Nagel, who is one of the people in the house was not interviewed until October 5th of 2022. In that, unre in that unrecorded interview, remember, none of these interviews were recorded except for, think luckies. In that unrecorded interview, Trooper Proctor claimed for the first time that Julie Nagel reported that she, quote, observed a dark object in the white snow by the flagpole, end quote as they left 34 Fairview Road on January 29th, 2022, seven months prior. Paragraph four. Significantly, on February 5th, 15th of 2022, defense investigator Paul Makowski interviewed Bill Walsh, operations manager of the Canton Department of Public Works, to determine whether any snowplows were dispatched to the area of Canton which includes 34 Fairview Road, Brian Albert's residence on January 29th, 2022. Affidavit of Paul Mikowski at paragraph four. We're going to read that after we finish the motion papers. As set forth in Mr. Mikowski's affidavit, Mr. Walsh indicated that a man named Brian Lucky Lochran was responsible for plowing the roadway adjacent to 34 Fairview Road, Brian Albert's residence. So immediately after Karen's arrest on February 1st, 
her team on February 15th sends their private investigator to find out who plowed the road. Five, on February 15th, 2022, defense investigator Paul Mikowski met and interviewed Lucky Loughran. During the course of that interview, Mr. Loughran explained that he has been the person responsible for plowing the area that includes 34 Fairview Road for three years. According to Mr. Loughran, he arrived at the DPW yard at 2 a.m. on January 29th, 2022, and left the yard in his snow plow truck by 2.15 a.m. He indicated that his route took him down Fairview Road with 34 Fairview Road, Brian Albert's residence, located on his left as he plowed toward Cedar Crest Road during his first pass. Mr. Loughran indicated that he made two or three passes down Fairview Road on the early morning of January 29th, 2022, and had good visibility from the truck cab because it was not snowing very heavily when he first started his shift. Mr. Loughran repeatedly stated that if there was a body in the front yard of 34 Fairview Road, then he absolutely would have seen it. In a separate statement, Mr. Loughran acknowledged that he was also interviewed by investigators from the FBI who indicated to him that one, the plow trucks were equipped with functioning GPS and two, the GPS data established that he actually passed 34 Fairview Road at 2.30 a.m. on January 29th of 2022. See affidavit of Alan Jackson. As set forth in Mr. Mikowski's affidavit, Mr. Loughran was also asked if he recalled anything unusual at 34 Fairview Road during his early morning shift. Mr. Loughran indicated that sometime between 3.30 a.m. and 4 a.m., when he was plowing Cedar Crest Road, he looked toward Fairview Road and observed a Ford Edge parked on the right side of the street in front of 34 Fairview Road. He indicated that the vehicle's lights were off and he could not see whether anyone was inside. When asked why the Ford Edge stood out to him, he explained that he was surprised to see that a vehicle had parked in front of the residence because it was after 3.30 a.m., it was snowing, and he hadn't seen any other moving or parked vehicles on that road during his prior passes through the area. Mr. Loughran further indicated that he did not want to plow in the Ford Edge, so he continued driving down Cedar Crest rather than turning onto Fairview Road as he had planned. Mr. Loughran indicated that he did not pass by 34 Fairview Road again after seeing the Ford Edge until sometime after 6.30 a.m., on January 29th, 2022, at which point emergency vehicles had already left the area. So remember, I'm going to break from reading for one second. The body was, the 911 call was placed at 6.04 a.m. When Lucky went by after sometime after 6.30 a.m., emergency vehicles had already left the area. There were no police. There were no EMTs, there were no first responders, there was no evidence collection teams, there was no crime scene set up. And this, again, is an independent witness, an independent witness with no ties to either side. Thus, Mr. Loughran is confident that O'Keefe's body was not lying in Brian Albert's front yard when Mr. Loughran passed by 34 Fairview Road at least two times between 2.15 a.m. and 3.30 a.m. on January 29th of 2022. Six, shockingly, according to law enforcement records obtained pursuant to a recent Freedom of Information Act request obtained from Bridgewater State University Police Department, Colin Albert, one of the individuals who is present at the Albert residence on the night in question, drives a 2018 Ford Edge. <clears throat> We're going to look at the proof of that. But this takes us to footnote three, which says, on August 20, 2020, August 20, 2022, mere months after Mr. O'Keefe's death, Colin Albert was pull pulled over by a law enforcement in a black 2018 Ford Edge, which is registered to his mother, Julie Albert.
Thus, a vehicle matching the description of Colin Albert's car was moved and parked in front of Brian Albert's residence at 3.30 a.m. on January 29th, 2022, in the exact location that would effectively hide where Mr. O'Keefe's body would be found mere hours later. The Bridgewater, Uni the Bridgewater State University Police Department records, which were obtained pursuant to a FOIA request, further noted that on April 10th, 2023, the Bridgewater State Police Department accompanied two FBI agents to serve Colin Albert with a subpoena at Bridgewater State Dormitory, Woodward Hall. Seven. Thankfully, the defense obtained this exculpatory statement from Mr. Loughran, despite receiving extraordinarily misleading and inaccurate information from Trooper, Trooper Michael Proctor. Significantly, on February 3rd, 2022, Trooper Proctor claimed that he spoke with Town of Canton employee Michael Trotta, who told him that no snowplows were dispatched to the area of 34 Fairview on the night in question. Trooper Proctor's March 15th, 2022 report memorializing his unrecorded conversation with Michael Trotta reads as follows. Quote, Michael assists with coordinating plow and sanding trucks during storms. Michael stated Canton uses town equipment to treat the roads with the exception of one company. Michael stated a company called, quote, by the yard, end quote, is used to assist with plowing the roadways. Michael stated drivers meet, met at 140 Boulevard Street at 2.30 a.m. on January 29th and then left from there to clear the roadways. The company by the yard was not called in until 3.30 a.m. that morning. Michael stated trucks were out sanding earlier but only concentrate on major roadways in Canton and would not travel down Fairview Road, end quote. This statement is patently false. Footnote four reads, notably when defense investigator Paul Mikowski spoke to Michael Trotta by telephone on February 14th, 2022, to determine whether any snowplows were dispatched to the area, which includes 34 Fairview Road on January 29th, 2022, Mr. Trotta provided Mr. Mikowski with Bill Walsh's cell phone number and suggested Mr. Mikowski reach out to him because he was the... Highway Department Supervisor and dealt with day-to-day -day operations and dispatch. Hmm. In point of fact, two separate witnesses, Bill Walsh and Lucky Loughran, reported that Mr. Loughran was dispatched to plow the roadway adjacent to 34 Fairview Road in the early morning of January 29th of 2022. Additionally, according to that same report, Michael Trotta is also purportedly, Michael Trotta also purportedly told Proctor Trooper, Proctor Trooper, Trooper Proctor, that, quote, all town trucks are equipped with GPS, but the system went down on January 24th of 2022. Exhibit C. Given the fact that nearly every other statement attributed to Michael Trotta by Trooper Proctor is provably false, this statement lacks any credibility. And that's why they're asking for these subpoenas for the GPS records. Moreover, this assertion is also directly contradicted by information relayed to Mr. Lochneran by the FBI, in which they indicated that GPS records from the, his plow established that he passed by the Albert residence at 2.30 a.m. Eight. Mr. O'Keefe's bleeding and injured body would have been on obvious display if Ms. Reed struck him with her vehicle and left him to die on Brian Albert's front lawn. Lucky Loughran drove his DPW-issued snowplow past 34 Fairview Road on January 29th, 2022, multiple times between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. before any snow had accumulated. And Mr. O'Keefe's body was not there. To be clear, it is not that Mr. Loughran said he did not see Mr. O'Keefe's body. It is that his body was not there. Similarly, none of the six witnesses who left Brian Albert's residence after midnight on January 29th, 2022, observed Mr. O'Keefe's injured body in the snow mere feet from the road they drove on to leave. Indeed, none of the individuals who collectively passed by 34 Fairview Road eight times, Mr. Loughran, twice, Jennifer McCabe, Matt McCabe, Julie Nagel, Brian Higgins, Colin Albert, or Sarah Levinson, 
observed and injured Mr. O'Keefe lying in Brian Albert's front lawn until after a Ford Edge, consistent with the make and model of Colin Albert's vehicle, pulled up and parked in front of 34 Fairview Road at 3.30 a.m. in the exact location Mr. O'Keefe's body was later found. <laughs> I see something in the chat. Hold on. I, when I when I um have to full screen to read to you, I I miss the comments and there's a lot of comments. There's a lot of good comments here that I want to highlight. So uh, hang on, Trish Norman. A lot of wow moments in this. I'm thinking that too because I've heard a lot about this, but this is a cold read for me. This is the first time I'm reading this, and I thought so. This is a real reaction video thanks care bear so glad to see more attention to this case it's kind of blowing my mind oh dr ed i'm 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 sorry that you're having a um surgery tomorrow i wish wish you very good healing vibes and hoping that you're feeling better very soon mods here are on it renee they are the best mods on youtube you have no idea you have no idea Charlene Ford Edge was parked right where John's body was found. Yeah, um, you know, and I heard a lot of buzz about the, these facts and these theories. And now that I'm seeing them in actual court papers, um, this is uh, kind of bearing a lot more weight as far as my legal brain is concerned. But, you know, we're going to, we've seen stuff like this in the Delphi case. Nobody wanted to believe that stuff either about the Odinist patches that the correction officers were wearing who were guarding Richard Allen in the prison in Delphi. So um, we've seen this kind of stuff before, but this seeing it all in court papers makes it a little more um, tough to swallow. Number nine, as explained below, Ms. Reed is entitled to the GPS information associated with Mr. Loughran's plow from January 29th, 2022. As set forth herein, this information is clearly relevant because it will establish, one, the precise times at which, which Mr. Loughran passed directly by 34 Fairview Road in his DPW-issued snowplow and did not observe Mr. O'Keefe in the yard. And the precise time at which Mr. Loughran observed a Ford Edge parked outside Brian Albert's residence in the very location Mr. O'Keefe's body was later discovered which caused him to continue plowing Cedar Crest Road rather than making another pass down Fairview Road. Furthermore, the dispatch and service records related to the DPW's snowplows during the period in question will further corroborate Mr. Loughran's statements and establish the falsity of the statements attributed to Michael Trotta by Trooper Proctor. Okay, and then they're going to make their legal arguments based upon Lampron, which is the case that everybody likes to say, cite in every discovery motion that I've seen in this case so far. And this motion was actually granted. So I just want to see if there's any more, anything other than more legal argument here. They're explaining why the records are relevant. not otherwise procurable and says they actually defense actually sent a private investigator to obtain any gps records from the department of public works regarding the truck sent out to plow the roadway adjacent to 34 fairview on january 29th 2022 but the investigator was informed that dpw could not produce any gps data Thus, unless this court grants the instant request for issuance of a summons for production of these documents, Ms. Reed will be unable to obtain these critical records in advance of trial. And then their third prong of their argument under Lampron is their argument about why the defendant cannot properly prepare for trial without inspection of the records, that it's not a fishing expedition, And this motion was granted. Let's go to the chat for a minute. Uh, just please note I am not in any way related to the attorney for the defense, Elizabeth Little. We are not related, despite we have the same name. So let's go to the chat for a minute before we read the affidavit of the private investigator who interviewed Lucky. Lucky. 
and see what he has to say about his interview with Lucky. And I know that if you are hearing this for the first time, this is pretty unbelievable, isn't it? Oh, thanks, Sunshine in Arizona, for becoming a new member. And also Gary Reed, who also gifted memberships, became a new member. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate you guys. All right, let's see if we have any questions. Please um, try and hit the like button. It helps the algorithm. And, you know, we like to get the word out because so many people are unfamiliar with this case that are outside of the Boston area. And it is now not only a nationwide case, I have viewers that are international that are talking about this case. Yes, the mo this motion was already granted. This was a motion from September, but I'm talking about it now to catch people up and to also read the supporting documents. So, yes. All right, let's see. Um, let's see. Any questions right now? Everyone's chatting with each other. Very nice, very nice, very nice. All right, I like it. Everybody's being sweet. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tiff, I was just saying about the Odinists, because we've seen some crazy theories and we like in Delphi. And um, so this is why we have to, when they're in court papers, we need to look at them carefully. And that's what we're doing today. It was just a, um, <laughs> yeah, I can see what somebody else wrote about that. All right. Now there's another, there's another Dr. Ed in the chat. There's two Dr. Eds in the chat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is crazy. It is crazy. Gets worse. Yeah, it gets worse. They claim, uh, Charlene says where they claim Karen hit John at 1230, so his body would be found by Lucky, the plow driver, Albert's own Ford Edge, which is being said where they dumped his body. Ms. Smith, I'm new to this case and not well versed in law enforcement policies. Would they have death investigation at the house right away if he died later at the hospital? Genuinely curious. That's a great question. If there's anybody who uh, is retired law enforcement in Massachusetts, they can let us know what they think. It certainly was a crime scene. I think we can say that. Can't we, my friends? And I have questions about why he was pronounced at the hospital at 740. I've got questions about that too. But... We will get to those questions later on another day. Here's the affidavit of the private investigator, Paul Mikowski, in support of this motion. He is a private investigator who's hired by the defense. Every, def every good defense team has a private investigator on retainer. This is not uncommon. And everything here that he states is under oath, and he is filing this affidavit for the truth of what is stated here. I, Paul Mikowski, under oath, do depose and state as follows. One, I'm a private investigator and the president and founder of the M Group LLC, a privately owned and licensed detective agency operating in the state of Massachusetts. I was retained by Works, Worksman Jackson and Quinn, LLP, to provide investigative services in connection with the criminal case currently pending in Norfolk Superior Court involving Karen Reed. Two, I submit this affidavit on personal knowledge in support of defendant's motion for order pursuant to Massachusetts Criminal Procedure 17 directed to the Canton Department of Public Works and the Canton Town Clerk. On February 14th, 2022, I traveled to Canton Town Hall to obtain information about any snowplows that were dispatched to the area of 34 Fairview Road on January 29th, 2022. I was directed to speak with Michael Trotta, DPW superintendent, but he was unavailable. I left my card with a member of his staff. He suggested that I speak with Bill Walsh, the highway department supervisor, and told me that Mr. Walsh and his crew had just left for the day after snow plowing all night. He gave me Mr. Walsh's cell phone number and suggested I call him the following day. On February 15th, 2022, I spoke with Mr. Walsh. Mr. Walsh told me that Brian Lochran was responsible for plowing the area that includes 34 Fairview Road during the January 29th blizzard and gave Mr. Lochran's contact information. Gave it to me. Gave me Mr. Lochran's contact information. On February 15th, 2022, I met with Brian Lucky Lochran. Mr. Lochran indicated that he has plowed the area that includes 34 Fairview Road for three years. On the morning of January 29th, 2022, he 
He arrived at the DPW yard at 2 a.m. and left the yard alone in the snowplow truck by 2.15 a.m. He was driving a six-wheel international dump truck with a nine-foot plow on it. Mr. Loughran said that his route took him down Fairview Road with number 34 on his left as he plowed toward Cedar Crest Road. Mr. Loughran indicated that he made two or three passes down Fairview Road during his shift. He said that he had good visibility from the truck cab because it was not snowing very heavily when he first started his shift. I asked him whether he believed he would have seen a body on the lawn of 34 Fairview Road if one was there from the view of his cab while snow plowing. Without equivocation, Mr. Loughran said that he definitely would have seen a body in the front yard of the house. Mr. Loughran further indicated he always looks in front of him and from side to side. He reiterated that if there was a body there, there is no doubt that he would have seen it. I then asked Mr. Loughran if he recalled anything about 34 Fairview Road from that early morning shift. He told me that sometime around 3.30 or 4 a.m. when he was plowing Cedar Crest Road, he looked toward Fairview Road and saw a small SUV parked in front of 34 Fairview Road. Mr. Loughran indicated the vehicle's lights were off and he could not see if anyone was inside it. I asked Mr. Loughran where in front of the house the vehicle was parked, and he replied exactly where the body was found. Mr. Loughran described the vehicle as a Ford Edge or something similar. We walked out to the parking lot to see if there were any vehicles that looked similar to the one Mr. Loughran saw that's this morning, that morning. He immediately pointed to a Ford Edge in the parking lot and said, it looked like that. I asked Mr. Loughran what stood out about the vehicle, and he told me that it was snowing and he saw no moving or parked vehicles on the roads on his prior passes by the road on his route during the blizzard and was surprised to see one parked there at that time. Mr. Loughran further indicated that he did not plow Fairview Road again until after 6.30 a.m. Signed and sworn under penalties of perjury, under the pains. Oh, look at what this is Massachusetts. Signed and sworn under, signed and sworn to under the pains, pains and penalties of perjury. This 31st day of August, 2023. What say you, my friends? What say you? Ah, oh, retired Irish in the chat. One of my lovely moderators who also is retired. <laughs> there he is. Well, they, that wasn't what I wanted to highlight. Cheryl, do you want to have... Cheryl, I was going to ask you if you want a wrench because we had one of our mods step down. So um, if you would like a wrench, let me know and I'll give it to you. Um, since you're here all the time anyway. <laughs> you seem to like it here. You seem to like it here. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, FKRFTV. Aiden's RO just got extended for a year because Tully made his ex a witness. How do you expose corruption if no one listens? I wasn't aware of that, but thank you for your super chat. And I will take a look into that later. Making Law Simple got to be a new member. Amazing. And Miss Donna Marie says, thank you for covering this case. And she's also my queen mod who does not put up with any of the bullying or any of the nonsense. Tom Gillis, golf instructor in the house, calling a witness if he wasn't in the house. I think he was in the house. It's been established that he was in the house. They never took a statement. They never took a statement. They only took statements from a couple of people who were inside the house. I don't think they ever took a statement. If they did, it was a long time after. It was not close in time to the incident in question. James Lynch says he had two and a half inch gash on the back of his head, but only six drops of blood at the scene. Head wounds bleed profusely. Where's the blood? Uh, the blood was collected into six solo cup, red solo cups, Dennis. Dennis, they collected the blood samples from the scene in red solo cups that they borrowed from a neighbor. See what I'm saying? So it gets crazy. Yes, he was. Yeah, he was in the house. Yep. Well, um, Sarah, oh, wait, hold on. This is crazy. Uh, Betty, the house should have been searched for blood residue. Well, here's the thing. The basement flooring was ripped up and replaced twice. The house was sold. 
So there's that. So there's that. Yes, Holly. The FBI went to Colin's dorm room to ask their own questions because they knew he was in the house and no statement. That's right. Brooklyn pays Zola. I can't even believe the state would stoop so low. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm like. But here's the thing, Brooklyn pays Zola, right? <clears throat> the DA's office works with the evidence that the law enforcement has collected, correct? It's not like the DA is going out and doing his own investigation. So he's working with what he's handed, right? If what he's handed has some holes in it, what's he going to do? I'm not insinuating that there are a hundred of people involved, hundreds of people involved in this, like Jennifer Koffendoffer said. Oh, in fact, the court TV appearance that I did was posted on YouTube today. And it's called it's called something like getting to know the players in Karen Reed. I'm going to look it up for you guys so you can look it up later. Don't leave now. Don't leave now. But you can look it up later. Um, and they cut off my very best part where I clapped back at Coffin Daffer at the end. So I don't know why that was cut off. Because like I told you the other night, and if you watched Glare last night, he went over it too. Thanks, Glare, for doing that. And I don't know who timed you out, but they're going to they're going to get a. A timeout. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it is edited. Yeah, it is. So here's what I did at the end. I said, because she said to me, well, I said something like, he said, what do you think is the most important piece of evidence? No, that was probably the last thing that I responded to that I didn't get to respond to. You know, Vinny, and I think, I think I turned Vinny around, you guys. If you watch that Profiling Evil show that I did on January 1st, go to Profiling Evil. First time I met, met Vinny ever after, you know, having watched him for over 20 years. <clears throat> and we were talking on Profiling Evil about the cases that were coming up in 2024. And I said, Karen Reed, we got to talk about Karen Reed. And he, you know, started his, you know, you really think that it's going to be, there's a, this conspiracy would have the, all these people. I said, no. I said, you want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me on Karen Reed anytime? Let's do it, Vinny. Let's do it. Um, three days later, I got a call from his producer to come on the show. Not knowing that Jennifer Koffendoffer was on until they, they did tell me ahead of time that she was going to be on. But I knew her position on this case because I watched another show that she was on where she talked about it. And I've seen some Twitter. I'm calling it Twitter forever. I don't care. I know what it's called X now. I'm just never, I'm never going to like, I'm never going to play the game. I'm just, it's going to be always Twitter. So whatever. So I knew going in that this was going to be a thing. And then the producer said to me, you know, don't be afraid to speak up. And he wants you to know. And I said, well, you know me, I'm not afraid to speak up. Don't worry, I, 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 it's fine. So Jennifer Kavendoffer said, I said, you know, I have a lot of questions. This is obviously a dog attack. This is the, you've, I've seen the arm photos. Um, where's the dog? Why was the basement flooring ripped up? Why'd they sell the house? I had a lot of things to say. And then she came on and refuted me by saying, oh, you know, all these people are spinning these theories that and these innuendo, she said, everyone who doesn't have an MD or a PhD thinks that they can tell that these came from a dog attack and they didn't. And um, the dog was rehomed because months after this incident, the dog went after another dog. And the, you know, she came up with all of this new information that on the spot, I wasn't really allowed to interrupt and say what I wanted to say. But at the end, I knew that I wanted to respond to this. And then he said to me, you know, what do, what do you think the most important piece of evidence is going to be? And I would have said, lucky, the snowplow driver, but I really wanted to get back to the pictures of the arm. And so I said, well, and I didn't say it like this. I wish I had prefaced it like this, but I said, I don't have an MD and I don't have a PhD, but what I do have is 30 years of trial law experience. And in my experience, I've handled hundreds, if not thousands of car accident cases. And what I can tell you with certainty is that the injuries that were sustained to John O'Keefe's right arm did not occur from a low impact motor vehicle accident, pedestrian versus car. They just didn't. They just didn't. And that was my final closing argument that was not shown on the clip from Court TV. But if you saw it live, you did see it. So I think maybe I turned Vinny around on this case because I had seen some of his coverage on this case before I met him on Profiling Evil. And all of the think tanks on there were all like, this is ridiculous. She's totally guilty. And innocent until proven guilty in this country. I thought it was innocent until proven guilty. Why don't we look at the evidence 
and make our own conclusions before we convict somebody in the press. It's just, it's crazy. It's crazy to me. You know, so when people leave me comments like, you're on the wrong side of this, don't ruin your career. My career is a, being a legal analyst. This is what I do. I analyze cases, all the cases. And these are court documents. So it's not like I'm pulling conspiracy theories out of the air. But I digress. So I think he's changed his tune on this. And you'll see. I think they're going to cover this case more now. I think they will. And I think that they are going to have um, a different spin on it and some different guests. And um, we are not the only ones who think that she might not have run him over. We're not the only ones. And I was starting to feel like... And sometimes my, my viewers, my longtime viewers, long time, I've been doing this channel. I, I started this channel in June of 2023 um, because there was a writer's strike and an actor's strike. And I also am, am an actor and a, <clears throat> I needed something to do to keep myself from going crazy. And so I started creating my own content in the form of this podcast. But during the course of my very, very long YouTube career, I often come on here and say, am I crazy? Am I, in, am I in the twilight zone? And I need you guys, my viewers, to validate me and tell me that I'm not crazy and tell me that I'm not in the twilight zone, that what I'm thinking um, really could be accurate. So it's nice to have a group of people who actually um, think that way as well, that maybe we're not in the twilight zone. We have seen police corruption here on Long Island at the highest level. I won't get into that again. But I will just say that in 2010, the Gilgo Four bodies were found. And during the police investigation, they obtained a description of the Long Island serial killer. Or he was the man who actually was a John to an escort who was found. Her body was found on Gilgo Beach. And the last person to see her alive, who was a John, who came to take her away for a job, was a man who was described as six foot five to six foot six, looking like an ogre, you know, long brown hair, 70s style glasses, and drives a green Chevy Avalanche. Well, because our police chief here in Suffolk County didn't let the FBI in because he had his own issues uh, with corruption, and because he covered up a beating in an interrogation room in a precinct, and told every other law enforcement officer in the room that if they opened their mouths, there would who knows what would happen to them. The case was never looked into properly. So our Long Island serial killer wasn't arrested until just this year, 2023. So, and then the police chief went to jail for covering up that other thing. And then our district attorney also went to jail, Tom Spoda, which is where he sits now in Club Fed, which is what we call federal prison. So I have lived through police corruption at the highest level and I back the blue hundred percent. So when people are like, this could never happen. I'm like, oh, oh no, it can. We've seen it happen. It's happened here. So it's, it can happen. I'm not saying that's what happened here, but what I'm saying is now the FBI is investigating the investigation. So let's face it. They don't just do that because, you know, Alan Jackson calls up and says, Hey, FBI, I think you really need to investigate this case. This isn't the way it works. So it can happen. Somebody said here, um, Law and Crime ran a family tree segment today too. Oh, they did? Oh, because the one that I was in on Court TV has the family tree as the thumbnail, which is not very, the family tree, which is not really accurate. It's the tree of all the people that were um, on in the house. <laughs> Crystal, at least if you start getting pulled over often, you know why, just saying. Are you talking about me? Thank you, Jessica, for your super sticker. I appreciate you. I appreciate you all so much. Uh, hi, Making Law Simple. Thank you for your super chat. Did you hear about the grand jury regarding Aiden and Karen? Yeah, that's what the FBI is doing. They're, they convened a grand jury and that is what they're looking into, all this stuff. So we know it's happening. We know it's happened or it's ongoing. And it's because of all of the publicity surrounding this case. It's not just because Alan Jackson called up and said, hey man, can you do me a favor? And, and uh, open an FBI investigation into what's going on in my client's case. It's not the way it works. <laughs> Candy, don't listen to the naysayer. No, it's a second grand jury. 
All right. I'm going to look into that. Um, but I can't talk about that today because I don't want to get sidetracked. You guys, I have ADHD. If I get sidetracked, we get off on a million different tangents. And I have like a, even though I'm not scripted, I have a little bit of an outline of what I want to talk about today. So let's do that. Let us, let us do that. All right. So let us not, if you guys are just joining, welcome, welcome. I'm Melanie Little. I'm a New York State attorney with 30 years of trial law experience. I actually am. Somebody was in Glare's chat yesterday. Moz, watch out for this person called, um, I don't even remember what the person's name is, but I'll think of it because I don't forget. Trashing me in the chat. She's not even a lawyer. She's an actress. She doesn't even do anything. Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it was, um, she doesn't know what she's talking about. I took on the Catholic Church. You want to come for me? Come for me. I'm, come for me in the comments, dude. In the comments. If merch, come for me in the comments. Respectfully come for me. Because if you're not respectful and you trash talk and you use foul language, you're going to get blocked and you're going to get timed out. And you don't want that. You just don't want that because you don't want to miss a thing. Yeah, it was, um, I'm going to remember this person's name because I like, hold a grudge like the best Italian Americans I know. So yeah, people are making stuff up. I don't know. Scarlett's arrived. Hi, Scarlett. Hi, honey. Hi, honey. Shiraz, I think this is going to be an exceptionally frustrating trial because the police botched evidence at every point in the investigation. Yep. Mm -hmm. And again, I go back to my own personal experience. Scobuffs, I went to see Boulder undergrad and University of Denver Law, and the Boulder Police Department bungled the John Benet Ramsey crime scene from the second they walked in. And to date, nobody has been arrested for the murder of John Benet Ramsey, who was killed in 1995. So it is not so outside the realm of possibility that things like this can and do happen. Are you with me? Let's get back to the documents, shall we? Here's the affidavit of Alan Jackson. And, and if you're just joining, we are going back because so many of my viewers are not as familiar with the Karen Reed case as a lot of you are. So we're going to go back and I'm reviewing the September motion that the defense filed to get the GPS records of the snowplows, specifically of Lucky's snowplow. Um, so we started and you can go back and rewind later. Don't do it now. You don't want to leave. We're going back to that motion from September. The motion was granted, but I'm showing my viewers who are not so familiar what the evidence is with regard to the snow plowing and lucky what lucky said. And we just went over that and we are going to now read Alan's Alan Jackson's affidavit, the smooth as butter. LA attorney who represented Phil Spector, also represented Kevin Spacey in one of his many cases. And I like his style. I'm just going to say it. I like his style. I think if he's trying the case against the Lally Splainer, as you guys taught me, that's what you call him, Lally, Splain, Lally Splains. Um, Oh, Dawn, thank you for being a member for two months, but I'm not going to talk politics. I'm not talking politics today, but I'm, I'm going to thank you openly for your uh, super chat or for being a member for two months. Um, smooth as butter, Alan Jackson. It's going to be a really interesting trial to watch. If the motion to dismiss this indictment does not get granted, those mo motions are rarely granted, you guys. I just want to prepare you. They are rarely granted. Um, Chances of this one getting granted, depending on what's happening with the FBI parallel investigation, I don't know. But I would ordinarily say to you that the chances of it being granted are slim and none, and slim just got on the bus with the rest of the bus stop people, which is a reference from another trial we, we recently covered called Maya Kowalski versus Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital out of Florida which resulted in a $261 million verdict. And we covered that case, case at length. We are still covering that case because it is the show that ever, never, 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 never ends. 
Lillian Cruz, thanks for your super chat. The police are charging Karen with intentional murder when it may have only been an accident. They are covering up for the real murder. I, here's the thing. I don't understand that. why were the charges upgraded. There was nothing new that was found. And I want to do a deeper dive into the charges. Look at the statutes, but we're not going to do that today. Tell me what you want the next show to be about topic-wise with regard to Karen Reed, and we will do that. I think maybe we need to do that because I'm having a lot of issues with a murder charge on this, intentional murder, even if, all right, now I'm going to digress. Now I'm going to digress for a minute. Even if she was drunk, but I'm not even going to say that she was drunk because all of the witness statements that we read yesterday, which were the ones that were taken closest in time to when this incident occurred, every one of them said that Karen wasn't drunk. She didn't appear drunk. Every one of them said that. So they take her blood in the hospital the next day. I want to know how that happened. Did they have a warrant to take her blood? I got questions about that too. And they claim her blood alcohol content at whatever time they did it the next day was around 0.08 or 0.09. Then they, they extrapolated back and they have this enormous range of what her BAC could be at the time of this incident. And yet every single witness says she was not drunk. I don't know how they're going to overcome that unless everyone's going to change their story and say she was slurring and she couldn't even walk out of there. And maybe, just maybe, she went home after she dropped him off and she drank a bottle of vodka. I'm not saying that's true, but that is within the realm of possibility of something, um, maybe a woman who wasn't, who was still, I don't know. It could happen because everyone says she wasn't drunk. So I'm having a little problem with that. Having a little problem with that. And that is from a legal perspective. We have a lot of questions, Sophia. We have a lot of questions. I have questions too. Thank you for your super chat, Sophia. I know that the chat is moving so fast and I'm not like telling you to give a super chat, but if you do, I will see it because on StreamYard, it goes into a separate folder. And, uh, and I just deleted one that I think I didn't mean to. So I apologize if I didn't see it. All right. Anyway, moving on. Yeah, they took blood the next day. I, and did they have a warrant to take her blood? Yeah, I have questions. I think what I read, and I'm not, don't quote me on this because I want to get the legal documents. It was like they said it was, if they extrapolated back, could be somewhere between 1.3 and 2.6, um, which is a pretty huge range. So I don't know what expert they used to come to that conclusion. They claim when they took it the next day, and I don't know what time, so don't quote me on that, but it was like 0.07 or 0.08. And they're saying it's like 0.13 to 0.26. Um, that is a very, very, very big retired Irish, who is a retired Irish detective, says if the test wasn't done immediately, usually it would get dismissed. Like, how did they even take her blood? Did they have a warrant for that? Because they didn't arrest her until three days later. So I'm just, I have, I have issues. I have issues with that. Yeah, Jody. so many questions. They keep coming. The more that's uncovered, I know. And it's crazy, right? Yeah, that is a range. Crystal says she found a guy not living. Her drinking after is not far-fetched. I don't even mean like, I don't even mean like after she found his body. I mean like after she went home that night. Everyone who we read the statements of yesterday said they were not fighting in the bar. They were not fighting. They seemed to be getting along great. They seemed to love each other, blah, 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 right? And she seems not drunk at all. Then all of a sudden, the next morning, the witnesses say she seemed to still be drunk from the night before. She claimed, they say that she claimed she didn't even remember going to the House of 34 Fairview. So there's so many weird twists to this. I'm saying maybe she dropped him off at their house at 34 Fairview. She was allegedly texting him and calling him from outside to see whether, you know, they were welcome to come in. She didn't feel well. She wants to go home. Maybe she went home and had some drinks. And then he never comes home. She gets really worried the next morning. So she goes out to look for him, which is when she backs into his car in the driveway. Um, maybe cracking her taillight. I have issues. 
Stacey says, all trauma patients get blood alcohol drawn. It's in an ER panel. But why was she in the hospital? Why did she go to the hospital? I have questions. Okay, here. Thank you to Madre for explaining this to me. I think the charges were upgraded when they found the voicemail of Karen saying how much she hates John and his kids saying they fought a lot about their relationship. Just because you fight with somebody a lot doesn't mean you intend to kill them. And yeah, if she did hit him with her car and then after she left a voicemail saying, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. How many of you ladies have <laughs> left a voicemail that you regretted leaving later? If we could only take back all of those voicemails from when we were angry. Sarah McDonald, if she was that drunk, why, did the bar, why didn't the bar refuse to serve her? Why did these two police officers not let her drive? I have so many questions. I have so many questions. So many moving parts. Okay, thank you, John. John Monagle, at the scene, she was hysterical and the police sent her to the hospital to be checked out. That is when they took her blood samples. Not sure if they had a warrant. Right, so I don't know if they'd be able to use them. I don't know if those would be admissible at trial. Back after this, I like that. She was a highly accomplished finance executive who rarely drank. The witnesses are lying. One of the witnesses said that she has MS. I did not know that. And I read somewhere else that she may have Crohn's, which would explain why she would not want to go to an after party with people she didn't even really know and wanted to go home. I don't know any of that, but yeah, big leap from arguing to murder. Thanks, Jen. Every car. And the, why would she call him 49 times? She was mad, she was mad that he went to this party. I, I don't know what she was mad about, but. Wait, she does not have Crohn's and MS? Tracy, we read that yesterday in one of the witness statements that that's why John wanted her to be friends with, I think, is it Jen McCabe? Because Jen McCabe also has MS? Is that a lie? Oh, somebody said that. Brittany says, yeah, she has MS and colitis. She had her entire colon removed. Okay, so it would explain why she would want to go home and be near her own bathroom. I'm just saying. She had illnesses that may have caused her to be careful with drink, yeah. So I think that they had been fighting about the kids. John O'Keefe was the guardian or the adopted dad to his niece and nephew who he took custody of when his sister and her husband died. And they may have been fighting about that. Maybe that's what the kids heard. Um, but everybody has problems in their relationship. So I don't know that that's going to lead to intentional murder. I mean, what does she have to gain from this? They weren't married. So it's not like follow the money kind of situation, when we off, which we often do. Um, and Brian Walsh, is Brian Walsh in the same county in Massachusetts? In Norfolk County also? Brian Walsh, who killed his wife and had all those insane Google searches like you know, how to dispose of a 120 pound body. Don't quote me exactly. Or, or things like that. Oh, here comes the uncivils. Yay. Uncivil and crew. Oh, it is. Brian Walsh is in the same County. Oh, that's going to be a great case too. Oh, he was in court today. Brian Walsh. Okay. So the, here's another interesting thing. Prosecution. Uh, you can't use your Google search data as a shield and a sword. You can't say, well, Brian Walsh Googled how to dispose of a 120 pound woman body and what's the best way to dismember a body. You can't use that evidence and say that the Google search history timestamps are completely accurate and then turn around in this case and say, oh, but no, they're not. No, she really didn't die. Uh, Jen McCabe really didn't Google Haas long to die in cold at 2.27 a.m. It was really after 6 a.m. You, you can't use it as a shield and a sword, pick a lane. And I heard they gave up that argument anyway, so I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. And that Brian Walsh smile into Vergata. Thank you, Maureen, for your super sticker. I appreciate you so much. Yeah, what is going on?
Back after this, just as an aside, new people, every single person in the chat whose parents account is fictional, who eats to no one that's okay. A will thinks she's guilty. It's all because of hate. Yeah, I'm getting those hate comments on my page as well. And what I will say in uh, response to that is I have the best moderators on YouTube. Many of them are retired law enforcement and we don't put up with it here. So they will quickly be um, blocked, deleted. And if you um, see it, just point it out and we will take care of it. That's what we do here. That's the way we roll. All right. Back to Alan um, Smooth as Butter Jackson's affidavit in support of this motion, which was already granted. But we want to go back just to see the evidence. He says, I've carefully reviewed the discovery produced by the Commonwealth in this case, including all police reports, grand jury minutes, crime scene photographs, and other evidence. We can't get a hold of the grand jury minutes, um, by the way, because they're under seal as they should be because all grand jury proceedings are secret. Crime scene photographs and other evidence. The factual assertions and reasonable inferences set forth in defendant's motion for order pursuant to Rule 17 directed to the Canton Department of Public Works and the Canton Town Clerk are true and correct to the best of my knowledge. This court heard extensive argument on defendant's motion for an order pursuant to Rule 17 directed to Brian Albert, Julie Albert, Colin Albert, and Brian Higgins on October 3rd, 2022. Um, just as a side, I did look for any video of that hearing. I could not find it because I think there was not as much media attention being paid to this case back in October of 2022. If anybody knows where that video is, let me know. I don't think it exists. But we're going to look at a transcript of that hearing. Uh, during the course of the hearing, counsel argued at length that none of the individuals who left the after party at the Albert residence on January 29th, 2022 observed John O'Keefe's body on the front lawn in spite of the fact that Mr. O'Keefe's body was supposedly mere feet from the road they took to leave. I think it's 12 feet from the road. Five, attached here too is Exhibit A is Trooper Michael Proctor's report concerning his unrecorded October 5th, 2022 interview with Julie Nagel in which she supposedly reported that she observed a dark object in the white snow by the flagpole as she left the Albert residence on January 29th, 2022. Just pointing out here, if you're just joining, Julie Nagel was in the, uh, was in the house that night. She was not interviewed, however, until October. This incident happened in January. Six attached here too is Exhibit B is a true and correct copy of responsive records received pursuant to a FOIA request which was obtained from the Bridgewater State University Police Department. These records are partially redacted in order to prevent the disclosure of Colin Albert's personal identifying information. Seven, attached here to his Exhibit C is a true and correct copy of Trooper Michael Proctor's report memori memorializing his February 3rd, 2022 interview with Canton Town employee Michael Trotta in which Trooper Proctor claimed no snowplows were dispatched to the area of 34 Fairview Road on January 29th, 2022. And that the GPS tracking system for the town plows were not working on January 29th of 2022. Eight. At some point in the last several weeks, I became aware of a recorded telephonic interview that Mr. Lochran provided to a third party not associated with the defense. Hmm. So this was filed in September of this year, 2023. And at some point, in the weeks leading up to September 2023, the attorney became aware of a recorded interview that Lucky provided to somebody else. On the recording, I was able to see the phone number associated with the interviewee who purported himself to be Mr. Lochran. I thereafter undertook to verify the user associated with the interviewee's phone number. On August 31, 2021, I'm sure that means 2023. That's a typo. My investigator, Sarah Ness, conducted a reverse search for the user associated with that cell phone number. She determined that the user associated with that cell phone number was, in fact, Brian Lochran. Additionally, the context of the interview clearly indicated that the interviewee was the plow driver, Brian Lachlan, who is a percipient witness in this case. During the course of this interview, Mr. Lochran again confirmed that he was the individual responsible for plowing the roadway around 34 Fairview Road on January 29, 2022. Mr. Lochran further stated the FBI said they had GPS at 2.30 a.m. going by that house, 34 Fairview Road. Put your DNA on the like button. Thank you, Stacey. 
Number nine, I am informed and believe that the requested records and information in the possession of the Canton Town Clerk and Canton DPW are relevant to the issue of whether Mr. O'Keefe was in fact lying incapacitated on Brian Albert's front lawn after being struck by a vehicle. The requested records will further substantiate Mr. Lochran's statement that he drove by 34 Fairview Road on January 29th, 2022 at around 2.30 a.m., on January 29, 2022, and Mr. O'Keefe was not lying injured on Brian Albert's front lawn, and two, that he observed a Ford Edge parked outside 34 Fairview Road, approximately 3.30 a.m. in the exact location where Mr. O'Keefe's body was later found, and thus continued down Cedar Crest Road rather than turning to plow Fairview Road. It will further impeach the statements made by the lead detective in this case, Trooper Proctor and town employee Michael Trotta, who, according to Trooper Proctor, indicated that no snowplows were dispatched to the area. Surrounding 34 Fairview on January 29, 2022, and that the GPS system used to track the town's snowplows was not working on the day in question. Furthermore, I am informed and believe that contracts and service agreements between the town of Canton and any companies that equip the town plows with GPS tracking and or fleet management services in January 2022 may identify additional sources of information that can be used to corroborate Mr. Lochran's statements and or that will identify additional percipient witnesses who may have passed by 34 Fairview Road on January 29, 2022. Finally, records relating to service and or issues with the fleet management database or GPS systems used to track Canton's DPW snowplows between January 24th and January 29th of 2022 will shed light on whether the GPS systems installed in the Canton snowplows were working in, in working order on January 29th, 2022, or whether Trooper Proctor simply did not want anyone to obtain that information. Accordingly, I have a good faith basis, good faith belief that the requested records are evidentiary and relevant. He says that he cannot procure the records any other way. Ms. Reed cannot properly prepare to defend herself without these records. Not a fishing expedition. Signed and sworn to under the pains and penalties of perjury in Massachusetts. Love, Alan Jackson. Here is Exhibit A. This is the interview of Julie Nagel, who was in the house um, but her interview her interview was not done until October. Let me just uh this for one second. Uh, I need to redact this. So give me a minute. Talk amongst yourselves for a second. And you'll notice also when we go through this witness statement that every single witness statement has the same, the same first paragraph. It's like nothing has changed. It's like a scratch and sniff. Okay. All righty then. Here we go. This is the uh, interview taken by my, Trooper Michael Proctor of Juliana Nagel, which was not taken till October 12th of 2022. No, actually October 5th of 2022, but wasn't typed up until October 12th of 2022, which is a lot faster than those other witness statements we looked at yesterday that were taken on January 29th of 2022 and not typed up until April. Maybe the typist was really backed up because there's no notes. No notes exist. So that's another question that I have, but we'll talk about that later. This is uh, Trooper Proctor's report 
these are his words, again, not signed by the witness, signed only by the trooper. I don't know if that's how they do it in Massachusetts, but it's not how we do it here. One, on January 29th, 2022, at approximately 6.04 a.m., the Canton Police Department received a 911 call for a male party, John O'Keefe, discovered unresponsive outside of 34 Fairview Road. Canton Police, Fire, and EMS responded to the scene. Canton Fire and EMS were dispatched to 34 Fairview Road for an unresponsive male discovered outside in the snow and CPR was in progress. Canton EMS transported the victim to Good Samaritan Hospital where he was determined to be deceased. Inside the residence that evening was Juliana Nagel who was visiting her friend Brian Albert Jr. for his birthday. On October 5th, 2022 at 11 a.m., Juliana arrived at the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office for a scheduled interview with Trooper Christopher Moore and myself. Two, Juliana has known Brian since 2015 and went over to his house on Friday, January 28th, 2022 for his birthday. Juliana stated her, Brian, Mary Kent, Emily Fabiano, and Sarah Levinson were at the house that night. Later in the night, Brian's parents arrived home with a group, a couple of friends, Matthew and Jennifer McCabe and Mr. Higgins. Juliana stated the group arrived at 34 Fairview Road from the Waterfall Bar and Grill. Juliana stated Mary, Emily, and Courtney left around 11 p.m. prior to the arrival of everyone. Juliana was hanging out in the kitchen with the Alberts, McCabe's, and Mr. Higgins. Juliana stated she was hanging out in the kitchen and everyone appeared to be in a good mood, did not observe any arguing. Juliana stated while she was in the kitchen, she did not observe anyone leave or enter the residence other than, other than herself. Three, at approximately 12 a.m., Juliana called her brother, Ryan Nagel, for a ride home. While waiting for Ryan to arrive, Juliana was looking out the kitchen window and observed an SUV stopped by the mailbox. The front of the SUV was facing towards Chapman Street. Juliana stated she observed the SUV travel along the front of the house and stop between the mailbox and flagpole where it came to a stop. Juliana then observed the SUV move again towards the flagpole where it came to a stop. Ryan arrived with his friend Richie and Heather in Richie's pickup truck. Juliana exited the residence out the front door and stated it was lightly snowing at this time. Lightly snowing. Juliana stated Richie was parked by the driveway and mailbox on Fairview Road. Juliana invited Ryan and his friends inside, which they declined. Juliana returned inside as Ryan, Richie, and Heather left. Four, Juliana left between 1.30 and 2 a.m. with Sarah and the McCabes. Prior to leaving, Juliana stated she did not observe anyone leave or enter the house. Juliana was seated behind Matthew, who was driving. Jennifer was seated in the front passenger seat, and Sarah was next to Juliana in the rear passenger seat. Juliana stated Matt pulled out of the driveway and traveled on Fairview Road towards Chapman Street. Juliana stated that it was snowing heavily at this time. As they traveled in front of 34 Fairview, Juliana stated she thought she saw something in the yard. Sarah stated, what, Julie? Juliana stated she observed a dark object in the white snow by the flagpole. Juliana stated she has been to the residence numerous times and this dark object stood out to her as something out of the ordinary, but was not sure what it was as they drove by. So this is the first time in October of 2022 that anyone is saying that they saw anything on the lawn, allegedly. Again, it's not signed by the witness. You can bet, you can bet that this girl was probably called in to testify in front of the federal grand jury that is ongoing. So I say, hmm. Let's say you. Here's the Bridgewater State University Police Department ticket issued. On August 20th of 2022, a little over four months before this incident. And it indicates that a black 2018 Ford Edge with Massachusetts plates driven by Colin Albert and owned by Julie Albert was stopped 
by one of their officers, I guess it's campus police, on August 22nd of 2022, motor vehicle stop, Burl Avenue, verbal to the operator for marked lanes and failed to obey traffic device. Operator was a confused football player who didn't know what direction to go at the intersection. Vised, BWC Active. So there's a proof that Colin Albert, who was in the house, had access to drive a Ford Edge owned by his mom, who was the sister-in-law of Brian Albert, married to Brian Albert's brother, parents of Colin Albert. It just adds to the mystery of this case. And again, on April, 20, April 10th of 2023, this was also subpoenaed from the Bridgewater State University Police Department. Colin Albert was served with a subpoena by FBI agents in his dorm. Oh, GM saw Colin this morning at the gas station. Oh, that's interesting. Moving on with our evidence. <clears throat> this is a... Um, a phone interview that Trooper Michael Proctor did with Michael Trotta, who is a town of Canton employee, which was, let's see, the interview was done on February 3rd, which was after Karen Reed's arrest, but a few days after the incident of January 29th, but it was not typed up until March 15th. I do not believe it was recorded either, but it was done by phone. Could have been recorded, but it just wasn't. What had happened was it, it just, it just wasn't. Number one, on January 29th, 2022, at approximately 6.04 a.m., Canton Police Department received a 911 call from a woman reporting a mail party John O'Keefe found in the snow at 34 Fairview Road. At the time of the 911 call, there was heavy snow and the temperature was in the teens. Officers Saraf and Mullaney were dispatched to the scene, along with Canton Fire and EMS. Officer Saraf arrived on scene and observed three females waving at him. Looking at 34 Fairview from the roadway, the three females were in the left corner of the property. O'Keefe was transported by Canton EMS to Good Samaritan Hospital and was determined to be deceased by Dr. Justin Rice. Okay. Two, on February 3rd, 2022, at approximately 10 a.m., I conducted a phone interview with Michael Trotta, an employee of the town of Canton. Michael assists with coordinating plow and sanding trucks during storms. Michael stated Canton uses town equipment to treat the roads with the exception of one company. Michael stated a company called By the Yard is used to assist with plowing the roadways. Michael stated drivers met at 140 Boulevard Street at 2.30 a.m. on January 29th and then left from there to clear the roadways company by the yard was not called in until 3.30 a.m. that morning. Michael stated trucks were out sanding earlier, but only concentrate on major roadways in Canton and would not travel down Fairview Road. Michael stated all town trucks are equipped with GPS, but the system went down on January 24th, 2022. <clears throat> the system went down, folks, on January 24th. Nothing to see here. Kind of like the way the um, surveillance cameras in Manhattan Correctional Center went down when Jeffrey Epstein decided to take his own life. And that is all of the exhibits from that motion, which were granted. So I'll come to the chat now and see if anybody has any questions, concerns, or things they would like to discuss before we <clears throat> decide what we're going to cover on the next show. This was a lot to digest for those of you who are not familiar with this case. Lucky, the snowplow driver, the independent witness, says he made two passes in front of 34 Fairview after 2.30 a.m. Did not see a body. There was no body, he says. 
There was no body. And then when he went to drive there later, there was a Ford Edge parked right where the body was found. And therefore, he did not turn down that way. So let's just take a look at a map for a second. All right, let's just take an, uh, let's take a look at the map. Sometimes it's good to get a visual. All right, so here's the house on Fairview. And we just read Juliana's statement, which said that they traveled in the direction of Chapman, which is this way. This way, if you can see my cursor. Then when Lucky came around Cedar Crest, which is right here, he got to the corner, he saw there was a Ford Edge parked right in front of the house, and he continued on Cedar Crest instead of going back down Fairview because he didn't want to plow him in, plow the car in, which is a very nice thing for a snowplow driver to do because anybody who's ever shoveled large amounts of snow knows how what a pain in the neck that can be to have to shovel your car out after it gets plowed in by a snowplow driver. So Juliana Nagel's statement does not say where the car was parked, but if it was parked in the driveway and they pulled out of the driveway and went towards Chapman, they would pass the left side of the house as you're looking from it, at it from the street, which is where the body was found. So when Karen Reed, and according to all the witnesses, pulls up in front of the driveway here and needs to get out of the neighborhood, there's really no reason for her to make a three-point turn when she can clearly just go right down this street straight to Chapman and just continue whichever way she wants to go. It just it wouldn't make any sense for her to do a three-point turn and go back into the neighborhood. I'm just looking at it from, you know, typical common sense bus stop juror. But I think they've abandoned that three-point turn theory. So we don't really have to worry about that right now. What say you, my friends? What say you? Yep, that's right. Marie John's body was 12 feet from the curb which means it was either, either placed there or she had to have hit him in reverse at such a high speed that it was it would throw his six foot two body, 220 pounds, 12 feet. That would not happen from a low impact motor vehicle accident, car versus pedestrian, it just wouldn't throw your body 12 feet. So I have questions. Thank you, Lori Leonard. The yard looks bigger in the pictures than it actually is. That's good. They probably use a fisheye lens for that. Back after this, says three-point turn was first theory. Then they smashed. She drove forward, slammed on gas to reverse, and hit him in the snow at 24 miles per hour, which is laughable. Yes, Lula, that's correct. No tire tracks. I didn't see that. No tire tracks. Although two of the witnesses we looked at yesterday said they were looking through the front door and did actually see tire tracks that looked like she made a three-point turn. So that was kind of interesting. The fact that the Albert's best friend came to investigate and never went in the house is enough for me, but it just keeps getting more suspicious. Yeah. And I'm just looking, look, I'm not, I have no personal connection to Karen Reed. I have no personal connection to anyone involved in this case, but what we do on this channel is analyze the facts of the case and analyze the court documents. And I, I got a lot of questions. 
There's a body on your front lawn of a person you invited over to your house the night before and you never come out of your house. And you're a police officer, a retired sergeant detective, fugitive task force former member or member, and you never come out of your house to see what is going on. And neither does your wife. It's just, it strains credulity. <laughs> It just strains Julie. I don't even know what their actual theory is now. We're going to have to get into this next. Well, Kathy Chapin, here's one theory that people have. Why would they drag his body right on the front of the street? Maybe they wanted the plow driver to come by and hit him. Maybe they wanted to. Maybe because they're all saying they saw Karen pull her car up there. Maybe they did want to try and, and pin it on someone who was, was not one of them. I don't know. I don't know, bus stop, sure. Uh, yeah, that house sold for something like 900, maybe a little over 900. We did go through the um, Zillow listing yesterday. Um, Bob Weir says the MSP originally lied about the road being plowed by a friend's company by the yard later. Disproven. Yeah. He was found face up, Sarah. Yes, because Karen ran over to do CPR and mouth to mouth. Cheeky Bobby, could the snowplow have pushed him 12 feet? I don't know. Betty says, ridiculous. She did not hit him, in my opinion. Kevin C. says, Chapman, then Sherman passed the library up to Pleasant Street to Meadows Ave. Right. And the library... Um, Security cam footage is the footage that was turned over, but suspiciously the two minutes are missing of when she would have driven by the library. Do I have that right, my friends? So there's just a lot of stuff that seems really fakakta about this case to me. His phone was under him. He was missing a sneaker. They didn't find the sneaker. The Canton PD, they want us to believe the Canton PD was so incompetent. But they couldn't find a sneaker and a giant piece of broken red tail light at the scene because only the state police found that 12 hours later after another, I don't know, there's some conflicting sort reports of whether there was a foot of snow that fell after they removed the body or 20 inches that fell. And then that big piece of red tail light is found and his belt was missing. His belt was missing. GM says, we were initially told he got hit by a plow. Huh. But then they decided to bring manslaughter, vehicular manslaughter charges against Karen and then upgrade him to murder. I just have so many questions. If she hit him at a high rate of speed, his body would have evidence of that. Yeah. Christy Kraut, the company by the yard wasn't a company hired by the town. The owner is a friendly, a friend of the family. Oh, that's interesting too. Ms. Smith, hello, my dear. Hearing all the potential corruption in this case, Delphi, and in Lisk makes me wonder about the Idaho case. Um, I don't want to talk about the Idaho case today, but I've been saying this for a long time, and I've been getting excoriated on some other channels. Um, that one little bit of touch DNA is going to convict him? I hopefully, there's they have a lot more evidence. Listen. Maybe it's going to be a slam dunk, but we don't want to digress by talking about that right now. Do me, but yes, Miss Smith, I, I hear your concerns. I, yes, I hear your concerns. Charles, did you say that you wanted a wrench? Um, I can't even get to this right now, but I'm going to give it to you anyway, whether you like it or not. Oh, you have it. How'd you get it? You already had one, I guess, or somebody else gave it to you. Um, sneaker and hat were missing. Yep. Sneaker and hat were missing. How do you lose a belt during a car accident? Why was there vomit inside his boxer shorts? Why did he have boxer fractures on his right hand? Why did the medical examiner call those clear, large lacerations on his right arm abrasions? And isn't an abrasion a scrape? I have so many questions. Oh, we looked at that one already. 
So here's another interesting thing, Katos. Um, Betty, John was alive when he was found. He may have been beaten in the house, but John was alive when he was put on the lawn and left to die. Because according to the hospital record, he was not pronounced until something like 7.40 in the morning, right? So what is that about? Hi, H. Bag. Read the transcripts from Lucky's interview with Proctor. Is that in the document that I just have? I don't know where that is right this very second. And I already closed out of it, but I will look for it and we'll look at it next time because we're not done with this, you guys. We are so not done with this. Thanks, Tracy, for becoming a new member. Hilsey, yeah, Juliana remembers the dark figure, but it doesn't investigate. And her friend Sarah says to her, What? And none of these statements, retired Irish, none of these statements are signed by the witnesses. They're, and none of them are recorded. And they're dictated months later. And then in one of their discovery responses, they say there are no notes. They're asked to turn over all the police, all the detective notes, all the, all the notes from the trooper. They don't have any notes. There's no notes. The notes don't exist. Is it me, retired Irish? Am I in the twilight zone here? It's a homicide investigation. Never secured to the crime scene. They never search inside the house. They find a cocktail glass, but they don't go inside the house to see if those cocktail glasses are inside the house. Like maybe he brought a glass outside and even just even the basic investigation of a death. It's a fatality. He's almost dead, right? It's, it's, it's mind numbing. I don't know. They didn't secure his clothes, right, Lula? Saw that somewhere too. His clothes were on a heap on the bottom of at the bottom of the hospital bed. They weren't bagged. They weren't logged. They didn't make it into evidence until something like March, right? I don't know, Tracy. I thought he was DOA too, but then I read last night that he was wasn't pronounced until 7:40. So I have questions about that too. They didn't even tape off the scene. Pezola, Brooklyn Pezola coming in with the dates. They didn't expect him to die outside until a few hours went by. And then they saw he didn't move. And, and then Jen McCabe is, is, is Googling at 2.27 a.m. How long to die in the hold? No, she's not going to play. I don't think she should. I, I don't think she should. I don't think she should. I think, I think there's mountains of reasonable doubt. Mountains. No notes on a deceased cop, especially. I'm a baffled too. I'm a baffled too. I'm a baffled. I got questions. It's Fakakta. It's just, it's a, it's a Michigas. It's a whole thing. You know? And then Jennifer Koffendoffer says, well, who is Karen Reed anyway? She's just, she's nobody other than somebody who is dating a cop. And, you know, like, why would they want to frame her? She is every woman. <laughs> That's who Karen Reed is. She's every woman except she has money. She has money so she can defend herself against this. Because any other woman with no money would still be sitting in a jail cell two years after this happened. I'm just, uh... Angela Marie, like some people can live even after drowning in the cold, like they have to slowly reheat the body. Uh, Lizika, there are punctures. Looked at the picture. That's, that's what I'm seeing too. Criminal med, being frozen can save your life. They may have tried to warm him and were unsuccessful. Okay. Garrett says, many witness names were, it appears, intentionally misspelled. I, you guys did point that out to me. I'm not even going to go that far because I don't even really think we need to because I am a, a spelling and grammatical error <clears throat> freak. I, I I am very meticulous about spelling and grammatical errors. I will tell you that in every document that I read, even legal documents that lawyers draft, there's always spelling errors. But you might be right. Proctor did not interview Lucky until August of 2023 after TB and interviewed Lucky. Shocking, right? Not. Hmm. 
Carrie Bear, did you see his clothes on the floor at the hospital? No. I didn't. They were on the floor. Even, even more contaminated then, right? John was buried, not cremated. Yeah. Yeah. And, and another thing that Jennifer Koffendoffer said the other night, she said that, because I said, where's the dog? Why don't they get DNA from the dog so they can match it up with those what are clearly perhaps dog attack injuries to his right arm. She said, well, the, well, the samples were sent out and they were, they came back, no dog DNA. Well, it's not what I found in some emails. And if I can find them, I'm going to pull them up for you. Emails between counsel, between the attorneys. That, that was not actually, they were not actually done. Let's see if I can find them easily enough. Talk amongst yourselves for a minute. Okay. All right, here we go. And this was an email dated July 21 of 2023. That's when it was written from Lally to Little, no relation. We've got receipts, folks. We've got receipts. So unless Jennifer Koffendoffer has some inside info, and please do not bash her in the chat. Please do not. I don't need anybody subpoenaing my chat or my communications. We've got receipts. So let's take a look. Know how I love receipts. Um, here's an email from Elizabeth Little. To Lally. And she says, I would also ask that any clothing swab samples be run with canine markers such that the dog DNA file type to be preserved for later comparison per Terry Kunz uh, May 18th, 2023 email. And then she says tissue. She's still looking for this stuff because, you know, they're, they've been a little um, <clears throat> lax in turning over discovery. Number six, tissue samples taken from injuries to John O'Keefe's right arm. Based on your omission of this request in your last email and my review of the latest batch of discovery, which includes what at least appear to be a complete list of the items of evidence seized in connection with this case, am I correct that law enforcement failed to preserve any tissue samples from the injuries to John O'Keefe's right arm? That's her email to him. And then his response to her says, on the tissue sample taken from injuries to Mr. O'Keefe's right arm, right here, my review of the lab materials that were provided to you in the course of discovery would be the same as yours below. There were not any tissue samples taken from Mr. O'Keefe's right arm. This email was sent from Adam Lally to Elizabeth Little on Friday, July 21st, 2023. 
What say you, my friends? What say you? Hmm. I just every question needs to more questions. Every question leads to more questions. Just another convenient detail they overlooked, says back after this. Lalo me, wow, incredible. Colleen McBee says German Shepherds are the attack dog at the moment. John Monagle says Coffindover worked at the FBI with Michael Proctor's father in law. She's protecting Proctor in the Commonwealth. There have been email exchanges between Norfolk County DAs and oh. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> I need a what say you t shirt, Sarah says. Yeah, I'm working. I think I should make that. My mods made me an amazing cup for a Christmas gift that says what say you on it. Like a, you know, kind of like a Yeti cup. Because I'm always <clears throat> drinking on this. I mean, not drinking, drinking, but it's, you know. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I did debate this with her, Liz, on Court TV, and I don't think she'll ever come on my show. Um, but um, it was interesting. It's, they just posted it today, but they cut off the end of it. So just... Uh, you can rewind through this later. And uh, I talk about it earlier in the stream. Thank you, Kelly, for your super sticker. I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. Lizzie Dalton, thank you for your super sticker. And Lizzie Dalton again for another super sticker. Thank you. Thank you, Deb, for your super sticker. I appreciate you. Hi, Nancy, Mammy DeMay, trying to become members. Um, You know, YouTube has a really weird glitch. Thank you for your super sticker, uh, super chat. A uh, really weird glitch where, like, if you have an iPhone, like, you need a special link. Uh, if one of the mods could drop that in the chat, that would be awesome. But right underneath this stream, it there should be a join button. Or if you go to one of my other streams, I know it's there because I see it. So I don't know. Laura <clears throat> says, thank you for your super chat. Mel, why is the FBI convened a grand jury? That is one part I don't understand. What would they need to convene a grand jury for? They want to hear from witnesses because they're investigating the investigation. So my thoughts are they're going to... They're going to take testimony from every witness who gave a witness statement to Proctor to see if they that is what they, in fact, told Proctor and that he wrote down. Because as I pointed out to you, none of those statements are signed. Um, they are going to ask questions of all of the witnesses involved in the investigation of this case to see whether they think there was a cover up or corruption or bias or any of those things. That's what they're investigating. So that's why they need the grand jury, because the grand jury can subpoena witnesses to come in and testify. And the grand jury indicts people. That's what they do. So that's what they're looking into. Yeah, you got it, Nancy. You you did it. Congratulations. Sophia did it too. Congratulations. Congratulations to all my old uh, new members so much. Yes, I agree too. I have questions. The poor kids and this are the real victims because they've lost, lost everyone twice. So sad. So sad. Um, and this show really is always about the victims. And that's why I want to focus on John O'Keefe and justice for John O'Keefe and not so much on the other players in this case and the other YouTubers that have covered it who are facing some struggles right now because I don't want to pull focus from the importance of justice for John O'Keefe and these poor children, these poor children. First, their parents are taken from them and now John is taken from them. Uh, it's, it's, so sad. And my, my heart goes out to them. My heart breaks for them. My prayers go out to them. And it's, it's, it's devastating and it breaks my heart. I have five kids of my own. It breaks my heart. Who rehomes allegedly a family dog of six years? Nobody, unless that dog was evidence. That's what I tried to tell Miss Coffindoffer, but she assured me that the real reason, because I was making a big deal about it was, um, that allegedly the dog, um, went after somebody else's dog and they all agreed between the families that it would be better for the Alberts to get rid of their dog than it would be to, I don't know, face a lawsuit. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I didn't, I don't know them personally. I don't know how cooperative they are that they would just get rid of their dog. I don't know. I find it strange is what I'm saying. I find it odd. And if I find it odd and you all find it odd, then I think a jury's going to find it odd too. Yes, this is also true. Cat toes. Uh, Canton, the town of Canton had an emergency town hall meeting and they passed a vote. The people of Canton voted to have an independent audit of the police department. 
That is true. R.I.P. Chloe the dog. Yeah, we don't know where Chloe is. We don't know. Tissue samples weren't taken from his right arm. I can't understand why. Wouldn't that be a basic thing that they would do? Who was present during the autopsy? Does anybody have a copy of the autopsy report that they want to email me? Fanbase at mlittlelaw.com. I can dig through all the documents, but I know. I know. Olivia, I don't know if you're here today. I don't know if Sleuthy is here right now. Um, but you guys are so amazing at finding the documents and sharing the documents. And it's so weird how the Massachusetts court system doesn't allow you access to the court file unless you're a Massachusetts attorney. I can log into every other state, Utah, Idaho, and in other states, they post on their homepage how to find documents for Koberger, how to find documents for Lori Vallow, how to find the documents for Richard Allen. They give you a special link so that you can go and get them because transparency is what our justice system in the United States is supposed to be all about. Sometimes they're behind a paywall. When I go into Utah, I have to pay 10 cents for every search or buy the page or whatever. And that's fine. You can do that. You can put it behind a paywall. When I, when I did the stuff on Kevin Costner's divorce, I got a lot of documents. I had to pay for them. I had to send an email request and pay for them, but they were still accessible. So I don't understand why these records are not accessible to anyone other than a licensed Massachusetts attorney. It seems to me like the transparency is a little bit, hmm, not there, not, tra not transparent. Hi, Ed. Thanks for your super chat. Why go ahead with the trial before the FBI finishes? Um, I don't think that this judge is going to let this case go. It may, be finish, it may be wrapping up. We don't know. Maybe wrapping up. I don't know, but this judge, Bev, seems real insistent that this trial is happening on March 12th. And I don't understand. Aunt Bev won't grant the order to exhume. Was there a motion to exhume? Would the family have to agree? What does John O'Keefe's family think about all of this? Haven't heard a lot about them. Do they feel like she did it? I have so many questions. Jennifer Bellinger, if I was the new owner of the dog, I would produce Chloe, but sadly she's long gone, probably buried in the pool. Nobody knows where the dog is. Yeah, I, I just... They're all impounded. No, not all of them, my father's keeper. Just the motions from Friday. Just the motions uh, about the the motion to dismiss based on the corrupt, you know, like that stuff's impounded, but everything else you can get. I have that order. Let me just see. I don't think we looked at the order at the beginning of this, did we? I already, I think I downloaded it. Hang on a second. Them. It was the motion for sanctions and disqualification of the Norfolk District District Attorney's Office. Hold on one sec. I'll pull it up so we can look at it together. A lot of people had questions about this. Like, what does that mean? So that'll be the last thing we will do. And then we will wrap on this for the day and let me know what you want to cover next time with regard to this case. Uh, this is kind of odd. We in New York, we I don't we impoundment is a term that we do not use here in New York. So this is new to me, but it means under seal. This was just filed a uh, Friday afternoon. Commonwealth versus Karen Reed order of impoundment. It says, after review of defendants' motions for sanctions and for disqualification of the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office and memorandum in support thereof, which is uh, paper number 190, if anybody's looking for it, you're not going to be able to get it, uh, filed during the late afternoon of January 5th, 2023, this court orders the motion and memorandum be impounded pursuant to trial court rule 8, Uniform Rules on Impoundment Procedure. I find that there's good cause to impound the motion and memorandum to protect the integrity of the federal grand jury proceedings re referenced by counsel. 
citing some cases. The order of impoundment shall be in effect until after the motion hearing scheduled on January 18th of 2024. So after that motions hearing on January 18th, which we will cover together, that stuff will be unsealed and we'll be able to see what was in there that was so important to keep quiet and not let us see right now because everybody what might be a little more irritated and upset about this case than many of you so many are. Thank you, Suzanne Seidel, for your super sticker. I appreciate you. Low a little 1989. 1989 was a really great year. It was a really great year. Thank you for becoming a member so much. Marie became a new member, Sophia and Nancy. I think we got everybody. All right, you guys, we're going to continue to cover this case. So let me know what you want to talk about next. There, I think I, want, I may want to talk about the motion to recuse and why that was made and why the judge denied it. So tell me what questions you have, because we need to catch up here on a lot of the stuff we haven't covered on this, which is none. We've done, this is the third show that I've done on this since Friday. So um, <clears throat> tell me what you want to talk about evidence. We can talk about, maybe we need to talk about the electronic evidence, the Google searches, the steps, how many steps John took after Karen dropped him off that were all recorded by his Apple watch. People are always watching you. So there's a whole lot of electronic evidence that we have not gone over yet together. And we will. Run the world. How are you? An OG, an OG from way back when I first started my channel. Just because a person was once employed by the FBI, it doesn't mean they're qualified to comment cases they haven't looked into into death. You went, oh, thank you. Thank you. Did you watch my performance on Court TV? Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Karen has motions to dismiss. We can talk about those. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do it all. True crime junkie, the OG. Glad to help. Woo, woo. Please explain the creepy family ties. Six degrees of separation. I was waiting for Kevin Bacon to come up during that argument. There is so much to talk about. So for those of you who are not familiar with this case, tell me the things you most want to know and we'll cover those first. I think maybe the the, um, the forensic electronics is something we need to go over because I need to talk to you about, yeah, electronic evidence, about all the Apple eye health data and how many steps he took and what was recorded and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're backing away from that 227 search now. I think they uh, have to agree because like I said, Brian Walsh, right? Brian Walsh is in the same county who's indicted for the murder of his wife, Anna. And he Googled all kinds of crazy stuff that they want to use against him. So they can't say in the Walsh case, oh yeah, all these timestamps are accurate when he Googled, you know, how to dispose of a 120 pound woman's body and what's the best way to dismember someone. Um, and then in this case, they, well, those timestamps aren't accurate. So considering it's the same DA's office, um, I don't know what she did in the FBI. <laughs> GM, it's in-laws and they all grew up together. They're all friends. It's a very small town. We know about these things in New York. We know how families stick together. We know about cement shoes and food for the fishes and horse heads winding up in people's beds. It's not that far out of the realm of possibility to think that maybe, maybe, families protect each other. I'm not saying that's what happened here, but I'm just saying it's not that far out of the realm of possibility, right? Proctor is also the investigator on Brian Walsh. Oh, wow. That's going to be fun. Katie May, thank you. And thank you, Eileen. Wow, wow, wow. That Brian Walsh case is crazy too. But the reason that I want to do this now is because the trial is coming up so quickly and I didn't feel like it was getting enough attention, this case. And I just, it had just rubbed me the wrong way ever since I heard about it. And crazy electronic evidence. Amy, you're not in timeout. What are you talking about? We see you. I see you, Amy. Awesome. Awesome. You're getting bigger. Good for you. Good for you, us, we, them. 
John says there's speculation they don't want to drop the charges against Karen and expose the shoddy investigation by Proctor because he was also the lead investigator in the Brian Walsh case. But that, like I'm saying, they can't use those Google. That maybe that's why they're dropping the, the Google search ish, time issue because they know they're going to need to use that argument against Brian Walsh. And if they had something incriminating in Karen's Google searches, wouldn't we know about that? Right? Where's all that evidence? I have so many questions. The more sunlight, the better, as Mandy Vatney says. Yeah, and she's the one who like blew up the Murdoch case, which is something else that I covered on other channels. That's awesome, Island Girl. That is true. Yeah, this is what I'm saying, Diane. This is what I'm saying. The timing of the Google searches are all good in Brian Walsh's case, not in Karen Reed's case, though. Nice job, Proctor and Guarino, Westfield State University forensic evidence data expert or device forensic device data expert. Like Judge Newman said, oh, what a tangled web we weave. Actually, Alec Murdoch said that first. There's a famous quote. But yes, then he did use it in his uh, comments to Alec Murdoch. Uh, unfortunately, I think that based on everything that's going on with Miss Becky down there in Colleton County, South Carolina, I think we are going to see another Murdoch trial. I think he's going to get a, um, a new trial because of that. I am not Elizabeth Little's sister. No, I am not. I think she's probably old enough to be my daughter, actually. But no, we are. There is no relation. There is no relation. So there, there is that. So with that, my friends, I say thank you so much for keeping it classy in the chat today. Thank you to my moderators. You do such an amazing job. You really do. Uh, the moderators on channels are are not thanked enough. So everyone, get in there and thank my moderators and show them a little bit of love because they are awesome. I'm going to say right now, um, barring any other really important matters that come up in my life, I'm going to schedule again tomorrow for four o'clock. It seems like a good time for a lot of people. Um, we can all get to our hockey games tonight now. We have the Rangers. <laughs> Let's go Rangers at seven and the Bruins at nine. And guess what? We're both in first place. So there's that. We're going to be happy about that for now. We can We can argue about our teams later. Do we have any hockey fans in the chat? I know Miss Donna Marie's a Bruins fan. I know that. We do. We're going to go to a game, Donna. You and me. I'm going to make you come to Madison Square Garden, and we're going we're gonna to go to a Bruins-Rangers game. That is what it is. So thank you all. Um, please subscribe and hit the bell so you get notified when I do go live. Oftentimes, I don't have a chance to schedule it you know, weeks in advance or days in advance, because I do have a very busy life outside of hockey and uh, this YouTube channel. So hit the bell, hit the like. Thank you to my members, my viewers, my replay viewers. And, uh, you know, just do all the things, just do all the things, keep it classy, be cool, be kind, be classy. It's not hard. It's really not that hard. Peace out, you guys. I will see you tomorrow, 4 p.m. I'll put the stream up. We'll look at the electronics. Have a great night. Let's go Rangers.